everyone for coming. It's a real pleasure uh, to introduce the speaker for the last seminar of this quarter. And that, that's Matt Gardner. Um, I think he's not a stranger to many of us around here, uh, doing some amazing projects at AI2, uh, collaboratively with all kinds of other people here. Um, although he's at, in Irvine these days, uh, the, the sort of connections and the collaborations are very strong for Scala2. And today we're going to get the pleasure of hearing about how we will know when machines can actually be. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. This is uh, fun to be back. Um, yeah, so how, how do we know when and if a machine can read? Uh, I will warn you at the outset that there, there is no training, there are no experiments in this talk. I am talking entirely about, <laughs> entirely about evaluation. Uh, how do we build test sets that are actually convincing? So one thing you might do uh, is build a data set, put up a benchmark. This one is uh, SQUAD, the Stanford Question Answering Reading, uh, Stanford Question Answering Data Set. It's a reading comprehension benchmark that was built a few years ago. And according to current benchmarks, uh, according to metrics, uh, current models substantially outperform humans on this benchmark. So can machines read? Uh, if you read some news articles, you might think that they can, but I don't think any serious researcher actually believes this because it's really easy to take any of these systems and push on them just a little bit and things fail in spectacular ways. So the question is, what do we do? If, if, our, met if our metrics aren't convincing, like remember, we're actually beating humans according to this metric, but we don't believe it. How do we build a benchmark that we actually believe? What would be convincing? Uh, I want to convince myself, I want to convince you that machines can read, what do we do? That's the question. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about a few different aspects of, of building something like this. So first, what format should this kind of a test about reading take? What should be on the test? And then how do we evaluate the test? Okay, so the first part of this, uh, what kind of format should this test take? Well, if we're gonna answer that question, we need to start with, um, what are we trying to test? We're trying to test reading. What does it mean to read? I think that's a really hard question to answer, but I, I can at least answer it this way. I claim that if a system, a person or a machine, uh, can answer arbitrary questions about a passage of text, then that entity understands the text. Hopefully that's not controversial. I claim this is a sufficient condition, not a necessary condition. There are certainly other ways you could try to define reading. And this idea is also, it's certainly not new. It goes back at least to Turing. Um, but what this means, if we, if we buy into this notion, uh, is that we can um, build a test that asks arbitrary questions about some input text and use that to judge uh, that the machine can read. Um, Maybe this is obvious, but it's worth pausing for a minute and saying, really, should we use question answering as the format for this? Uh, I would say, I don't really think we have any other options. There are linguistic formalisms for things about like sentence level linguistic structure that are some aspects of reading, right? This uh, syntax and uh, semantic role labeling tells us like who did what to whom and we can recover some local aspects of, of what it might mean to read. But once you go beyond a sentence, there really isn't anything that we get in terms of like formalisms from linguistics that will really help us define what it means to read. So I think, you can tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm missing something, but I, I think really question answering as I've framed this is the only option that we have to test reading. Okay, if we buy at least for the rest of this talk that we should use question answering, what, what kind of question answering? This is still very broad. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that we should standardize on a particularly simple kind of format here, where as input I get a paragraph or a few paragraphs of text and a single question, and I can produce as output anything that I can evaluate. This could be a span, it could be a set of spans in my input, it could be numbers, dates, even free text if I figure out some way to evaluate it. I care a lot more about the input format so that I can have a model that operates on whatever kind of question I want uh, without having to like worry about different input formats. So you might recognize this, this looks like squad. And um, it's also worth considering here, like so I'm, I, I'm in some sense, at least for the reading problem, throwing out a bunch of other things people have built. 
like, for instance, Trivia QA that was built here doesn't fit this format, at least in, in its basic uh, arrangement. Um, that problem involves reading comprehension, but also retrieval. And why should we standardize on this? I say, at least for this problem, we haven't at all solved reading. Uh, retrieval is a really interesting problem, but for this, uh, uh, I, I want to solve what it means to read and how we evaluate that. So this is why um, I would say focus on this. Then this also um, uh, throws out multiple choice questions uh, and other similar things that you could do. Natural language inference as like a sentence fair classification format, you could do very similar things. Um, and multiple choice questions and natural language inference formats are very related to each other. Um, <clears throat> why not these? Uh, they both have problems. Um, when I construct the answer choices that are wrong in a multiple choice question answering setting, I'm going to introduce biases. That's unavoidable. Um, and uh, similarly, getting, getting negative uh, examples for natural language inference is going to have basically the same problem. And so if we, um, if we avoid that, um, we're going to have a, a better, more rigorous test, basically. Similarly, um, if we want a discriminative test, we should have a high entropy output space. Uh, here, if I only have a few choices or a simple three-way classification decision, um, it's really low entropy, whereas with free-form output text, I have a much richer signal to evaluate and a much richer signal to learn from. And so um, if I have to pick a format, uh, probably I should pick one that has, like if, if there are options that I can pick from, something that has higher entropy output is a priori, at least should be uh, preferred. And then lastly, um, when I try to model something like this, I'm going to do a, a, to have a very different process than modeling something like this. Both in machines and in people, you answer this kind of question very differently than you answer this kind of question. So uh, anyway, bottom line here is uh, I propose that for this test, we standardize on squad style inputs as the best um, format that we have right now to test this problem. OK, ho uh, hopefully that wasn't too trivial. Um, uh, but I think establishing the format of the test is important. Now let's move on to what, what is on it. What kinds of things do we want to test? <clears throat> Go ahead. Sorry, real quick. What is it squad style being used in quick practice? Squad style inputs. Yeah. So output is arbitrary, whatever you want. <clears throat> or rather, whatever you can evaluate. Okay. Yes. I, I would say we haven't solved paragraph level stuff yet, so let's fit, let's. Those are interesting questions. I don't think we can get there yet. We haven't even like there. As as I will show you, there is a ton that we haven't covered on paragraphs. So that's where I want to start. But you are restricting the output from being multiple choice, right? So what what kind of? I mean, I saw the four options you had on the previous slide, but like you clearly had some. Uh, specific things that you don't like, are there some specific things that you do like for evaluation? So you said I'm restricting the output from, from being multiple choice. Actually, I would claim that uh, in this setting, that's, that's an input to the model. It's not an output. Okay. Yeah. And, that's, and, and be, because it's an input, it biases the problem. And that, that's exactly why I say multiple choice is not great. Uh, OK. So what should be on this test? Uh, remember, my, my claim was that if, if I could answer arbitrary questions about a passage of text, then I understand the question. For this to actually be convincing, I have to really, really mean arbitrary. Anything you could possibly think of uh, I, that I can throw at you, you have to be able to answer it. That's pretty daunting. That's pretty underspecified. If we want to actually make progress on this, we have to make it concrete somehow. And, and what I propose, what I've done and will show you, is trying to break this down into chunks that we can make progress on. Think about what are the aspects, what kinds of questions, what class, broad categories of things would you try to ask of, about a paragraph? And then build targeted evaluation sets um, on those aspects and make progress uh, over time by um, asking about increasingly uh, broader and more challenging things. OK, so what are those things? The first one, uh, epitomized by squad, is sentence level linguistic structure. This is like, who did what to whom? Um, here, we've got our squad inputs. And what squad has you do 
basically, I, I like to think of this in terms of reading primitives, the operations that the, that the, the data set wants you to do. The first thing that, that you do is you localize a question to some place in the passage. So here, the question is some paraphrase in squad, unfortunately a very, very close paraphrase most of the time, but this question describes some event that happens here. I have to find it. That's my first reading primitive. And then my second one is extracting an argument that is specified by some question word. I extract the argument that's, that's um, uh, asked for here, and I return that as my answer. Fair enough? Two basic reading primitives that I have to do. Localize the question, extract some argument. And that, by extract some argument, this is like an explicit reference to predicate argument structure, sentence level linguistic stuff, right? Um, squad two uh, brought in this just a little bit, and it said, hey, uh, actually, maybe there are some tricks where um, the question word itself might uniquely identify the argument, and so I don't actually have to do this localization step. And so um, squad two says, I'm going to have questions that don't localize here so that I can't just cheat. I have to actually know that the question does localize. Um, but it's still basically two reading primitives, localization and uh, argument extraction. Okay? But squad really still just, just scratches the surface here. There, there are a lot of different kinds of sentence level linguistic structure that we could be asking about. And it only tests cohere, or it only tests this um, linguistic structure uh, in like one part of the passage. It's really easy to localize the question um, to a specific spot, and it doesn't really um, test like your, your broader coherence of the linguistic structure of the whole paragraph. So we can push on this in one particular direction. Uh, we did this with a data set called Drop. If you're familiar with this uh, data set, you may have heard it described as like a numerical reasoning data set. I mean, I think that's fair. It does require that, but that's not how I think of this. That's not, that's not our intent when we built it. I think of this as a predicate argument structure data set, but one that, that is intended to enforce broader coherence across understanding the entire paragraph. To explain that, um, we still have the same two reading primitives. We have to localize the question to the passage, and we have to extract argument. Um, except that when we're localizing the question, it'll localize to several different places. The question describes a class of events of which there are probably several in the paragraph, and then I have to find all of them, extract some argument from them, and then um, the numerical reasoning comes in uh, when we aggregate something about all of these, these events that we found, and then get some answer. And we use the numerical reasoning here as the best means of actually forcing some kind of aggregation. So there are additional numeric reasoning primitives that are needed, but as far as reading goes, it's still just those same two operations. Localize the question, extract an argument. As an example of what this looks like, um, most, uh, maybe half of the paragraphs in this data set are taken, taken from Wikipedia descriptions of uh, American football games. So we get things like people uh, kick field goals, throw touchdowns, and whatever. Here we get a question that's which kicker kicked the most field goals? So um, Kicking a field goal is a class of event that we have to localize to a bunch of different places here that are in bold. I don't know if the color is really visible. Um, but um, you localize to all of these things. You pull out an argument, which is the kicker. That's the one that's requested in the question. And then it turns out you have to group by the, the kicker, um, count, and do an argmax to get the answer. Fair enough? So again, uh, reading comprehension, much, much, much more complex than what you see in squad but still targeting the same basic reading stuff. It's still just predicate, predicate, predicate argument structure, just on a larger scale, and with some additional stuff thrown in. OK. So um, recognizing that even this still, there's a lot more that we could do on lingu linguistic, like, like sentence level structure. There's, this only does a small piece of it, but uh, we can move on to other kinds of things that we, we might want to ask about, such as discourse structure. Um, this might mean tracking entities across a discourse, things like co-reference resolution. It might be understanding how, how phrases fit together, discourse connective kinds of stuff. Uh, it might be um, recognizing or tracking whether a discourse is coherent, how things build up to something larger, this kind of thing. Um, and on this, we pushed on one small piece of this, which is tracking entities and co-reference resolution, and built a data set that we called QuoRef. This is a question-based co-reference resolution data set. Here, um, the same basic reading primitives are the same. I want to localize the question to some part of the passage and extract an argument. It just turns out that by construction in QuoRef, most of the time, that argument 
is a pronoun. And then you have to resolve that pronoun to some other part of the passage, and then perhaps extract another argument from the place that you localized that pronoun to. So now, in addition to our two basic primitives of localizing the question and extracting an argument, I have another primitive of resolving an ephra. Okay, what does this actually look like in practice? Uh, here's an example. Um, hopefully, it's big enough. So, what is the Byzantine name of the game that Emperor Basil I excelled at? Turns out this localizes pretty easily to write here. Emperor Basil I excelled at it. It is the argument that you are supposed to extract, but it's a pronoun, so you have to figure out what that pronoun is. And in particular, it's asking for the Byzantine name, so I have to take it, track it back to the game, the game, uh, Polo, Tikanion, however you say that word. So that's how you answer this question. Similarly, what are the names of the sport that is played in its Tikanisterion? Here, it's pretty easy to localize that question to right here, a stadium for playing the game, but I have to track the game back to its previous mentions and pull out the set of things that are names, which is Polo and Tsikanion, and so on. Again, this is, um, uh, a lot of people like to like um, say extractive question answering is some very simple task, uh, thinking of squad. Turns out you can do a whole lot with extractive question answering. This is much more complex than squad. Okay. Um, uh, some more examples, I'll just move on. So that was discourse uh, uh, structure that you might, that, that's one aspect of reading that you might want to query. Another one is what you might call implicative meaning. Um, there's probably a good linguistic term for this, but I don't know it. Maybe one of you could tell me. Um, so this, this is like, what, are, what, what do the propositions in text imply about other propositions that I might see in the text? So for example, if I see the text, Bill loves Mary, and Mary was just diagnosed with cancer, understanding those two things means that I will also know that Bill is going to be very sad. That's what it means to understand those, right? The, the, that we know that there are implications on future things that will happen. Where do these implications come from? Um, some of them, like, you could think of this, this is like what's in the lexical entry uh, in your grammar for particular words, right? Uh, that love carries with it some implications about stuff, and uh, we learn that through our just general language. Whenever we, whenever we learn our, our lexicon for our, our language, that's what we learn. Um, some of it's like common sense. In other cases, this is expressed in text, and we can read it. And so um, we built a data set that tries to read these implications and then apply what they mean. We called this ropes, reasoning over paragraph effects in situations. What we did was we found paragraphs in Wikipedia and in science textbooks that described causal language, mostly about science stuff. So here, um, this, you don't need to pay attention too much to the actual text here, but it describes plants and how they are pollinized and that insects are better pollinizers than wind. <clears throat> and, and because of this, um, plants evolved uh, flowers in order to take better advantage of the insects. We took paragraphs like this, we showed them to people on Mechanical Turk and had them write a situation that instantiated in some way the cause or the effect that we see in the background. So here, someone wrote a situation that said someone was visiting uh, a national park and saw some flowers and some of them spread pollen, said spread pollen via wind and some of them spread pollen via insects. So this is, the situation describes the causal stuff here from the background paragraph. And then we have questions that query the effect. So would categ which category of flower would have more efficient fertilization? Well, it's the one, if you read this and understand what it, what it implies, the one that has insects to pollinize it would have more efficient fertilization than the one that doesn't. Okay? Once again, this is extractive. The answer here is a span. Very, very different from what you see in squat. If we think of this in terms of reading primitives, it gets a bit more complicated. Uh, again, we have to localize stuff. I don't know that my colors worked all that well, but um, the question localizes to a few different parts of the passage. Here we have category B and category A that points to, point to parts in here, and we have this, which is, a, which is a, the, the more or less efficient fertilization is a pretty direct reference to something that we see in here. So we have to localize those two parts. And then we have to find something that we can chain together to get from the part in the background that we saw to the part, uh, to, to the two things that we saw in the situation, 
with some associated polarity. So this is like a chaining, chained inference kind of primitive. That's, maybe I'm using that term in a, in a too informal way, but this, this primitive is something like chain, chaining of stuff together. Okay, what else? There, there are lots of these. There, there's so much uh, in, in reading that, that, that we could push on. Um, so time, temporal ordering of events, duration of events, which things are events in the first place. These are all kinds of things that are involved in reading that we could build data sets around. Um, this is one that we're just starting data collection on. It's in progress right now. Um, th this is a data set where we take uh, sentences, maybe from news articles, maybe from wherever you want, we have people label all of the events that are in there. So there was a weighing, there was an accusing, an abuse, an obstruction, and all of these things. And then we might ask questions like, what things happened before the president was accused? And then require some kind of temporal comparison between all of the events that we see. What things ended before the parties girded for debate? The only things that we're, we can actually be sure of, but sure, of that, uh, sure of that for are the abuse, the obstruction, and the conduct. What things haven't actually happened yet? Um, it's not really explicitly stated anywhere, but um, because they're weighing stuff, the accusing hasn't actually happened yet, and because they're girding, that means the debate hasn't actually happened yet. So this is quite complex lexical kinds of inference that you have to make about temporal ordering of things. Okay, um, in terms of reading primitives, what's going on here? Now we've, with this totally different kind of question. We've introduced a bunch more. Uh, we still have this localization where um, this question this uh, is localizing itself pretty clearly to that accusing event. But we also just have a general event detection primitive. We need to say what things happened, what, what, what events are described in the text in the first place. And then we have this like event comparison kind of operation that's parameterized by a word that we saw in the question. Okay, what else? Um, grounding. A key part of reading is understanding what you see in terms of some background knowledge that you bring to the text. So <clears throat> this could be common sense knowledge, uh, it could be factual knowledge about entities and things that are talked about in, in the paragraph. Uh, more broadly, um, speech acts are an intent by a speaker to induce some mental state in a listener, a, a mental state about the world in a listener, and so the act of reading comprehension must in some sense boil down to trying to recover the intended world state. And so this is grounding the text that we see into something about the world. Um, this kind of thing, uh, I don't have a data set yet for, uh, don't have a data set for yet, but we, we've thought about some things. One thing you could do, I'm not totally satisfied with this framing of it, but um, here's a, a paragraph about um, some special counsel investigation months ago. Um, and we see things like Mr. Mueller and Mr. Trump and Ms. Pelosi. And you notice that, I guess, Mr. Trump is described as a president, but it's not described who Ms. Pelosi or Mr. Mueller are. And so you could try to ask questions that uh, require having known who these people are in order to answer them. Like, what did the special counsel cite? That one, because there's only one citing event in this paragraph, might be too easy unless you have unless you have other questions like who did, what did the Speaker of the House cite that has no answer. So you'd have to be careful, careful about how you construct this. And again, maybe this isn't the right way to pose this problem. I'm not totally sold on this yet, but you could do something like this to try to, to require some kind of background knowledge when you approach uh, a new paragraph to test, does a, does a system have prior knowledge about the world so that it can actually understand what's going on here? Um, Another way, I'm happier with this one, but it's also hard to collect probably. Um, you could, this, this is a description of a room. And you could imagine asking questions that, that ask, can, can I like visualize the room from, from the description that I saw? Asking things about spatial relationships or other kinds of stuff. Like, what things could you sit on? Has the room been cleaned recently? This kind of thing. And we could go on and on and on. There are all kinds of things that you would have to actually put into this test to make it really convincing because reading is complicated. And uh, we've, uh, call, calling squad a, a, a benchmark of reading comprehension um, is, is quite optimistic. It tests one tiny little piece. Okay. Um, with that, I'll, I will move on. Um, 
I guess I will note that it, it's a little bit daunting thinking about all of the stuff that we would have to, to build here. But I, I don't think we will actually convince ourselves that machines can read until we do this. I don't, I don't know how else to do it. And so um, this is a call to all of you uh, to participate in, in finding something and building a data set on it. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're open to questions there. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is about the, the way you break down the problem and the primitives. Um, I'm curious to what degree the folks over in the human reading subcategory have also thought and articulated these primitives and, 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 and broken them down. Have they done so in a similar way? Have they identified other problems that maybe we're not thinking of? Is there a literature there that, that should inform how we think about reading? I've read some of it. I haven't read as much as I should. Um, when I do read that literature, they think about things very differently. Um, and it's more like the process is I see the text, and then I, f I, I read the words in the text. And then it goes up here, and it does something. And that something is pretty not well defined most of the time when they talk about these things. And that's what we really need to, to figure out here. Maybe it, it's quite possible there's stuff there that, I, that I'm not aware of, but I didn't, I, I didn't see much there when I was looking through stuff. Like, like they're, they're, wor they're worried about other problems. It's like, what are the cognitive things that go on when, when a person sees text? And, and not like, what goes on? Like, how, how do you computationally understand what it means to read? There's just very different focuses. Um, the, there is definitely like this um, speaker meaning and, and recovering uh, intended world state. Uh, this is something that's explored a bit, yeah. Um, OK, so we've talked about what the test should look like, what should be on the test. How do we evaluate the test? Um, one really big problem with what I've talked about is that our output format is incredibly limiting. Um, I, I've made the point a few times that you can do a whole lot with extractive, or let's see, whatever. I probably don't need to go back. But I've, I've made the point a bunch of times that you can do a whole lot more than Squad did with extractive QA as a format. But it's really hard to ask like a, a why question, for example. Why did someone do this uh, with wh where I'm requiring the answer to be a span in something from my input? And so if we really want to get past simpler notions of question answering, of reading comprehension, um, we need to be able, be able to evaluate more complex outputs. Um, so I don't have a solution to this. But uh, what we've done so far is measured the problem, and we're working on trying to solve it. Um, so just to demonstrate what uh, I mean here, um, when people have built generative question answering data sets, something like narrative QA, if you're familiar with this, um, and even extractive data sets, uh, we have metrics that are we, people use like machine translation metrics, like uh, Meteor, Blue, Rouge, summarization kinds of metrics. Um, and there's this F1 metric that Squad introduced uh, that says basically how much overlap is there between my predicted answer and my gold answer. And so what we did was we looked at a bunch of examples from a bunch of data sets and measured or labeled ourselves. Um, given the gold answer and a predicted answer, was the machine right? In this case, they are. Because the drug dealers, like if you say two men, those are the drug dealers in this paragraph. And so these two, are, this, this answer is correct. It's the same thing as that, right? And so humans say um, these are exactly the same. There is no overlap here. And so overlap-based metrics fail completely. Uh, a data set where we have extractive stuff, um, I guess even, even here, those are both like extractive. But, uh, Another example of an extractive failure, um, this is, we see this kind of thing a lot in the ropes data set that I talked about earlier, um, where answers are things like tip A or tip B. And obviously, there's a whole lot of overlap here. And so any overlap-based metric is going to give this a high score, even though it's completely wrong. So we really need to solve this problem with our metrics if we want to trust the output of our test. Um, just to summarize uh, a bunch of these results, um, we annotated, I think it was like 500 examples from narrative QA, stem of, a stem of all task that was originally multiple choice, but we wanted to convert it into a free form answer. And so we trained a model to do generative QA on the right, uh, on the, like to generate the correct answer. 
Um, and then ropes is a data set I described earlier. And we measured correlation of a bunch of existing metrics, uh, including some recent ones like BERT score and census mover similar similarity. Uh, and none of them correlate particularly well. On, meteor, on, on narrative QA, Meteor does maybe OK. Um, but it, it's really not as good as we would like. And especially as the, the data gets more complicated in what we're trying to measure, um, the, the metric gets harder. Uh, the, the, the metric gets worse. That is, um, the semival task, because it was originally multiple choice, actually has much more variety in the kinds of freeform outputs that you're trying to evaluate than narrative QA does, and the metric performs correspondingly worse. How do you solve this problem? Um, again, we don't have a solution yet, but what we are doing right now is collecting a big data set of um, context, question, gold answer, predicted answer from a bunch of different systems and labeling it so that we can learn a metric and have a, an evaluation that we're confident about of the metric itself. We're going to have to solve this problem if we want to actually get to a good test. For the extractive question answering, um, why does it make more sense to compare the words instead of the location? Like most of the examples you showed were like the man or two men is mentioned once. So if you say this location versus uh, like tip A, tip B is a better example, I guess. So like if you say tip A and tip B, those are completely distinct and there's no overlap there. So you're assuming that my answer is labeled as a location. My answer might just be labeled as a string. So then what do I do? But the string would probably be in the text in very few locations, at least in the examples you've shown so far. So that's a reasonable point. I need to think that I, I'm pretty sure I could come up with some examples where it fails. But you're right that it would solve some of these. Yeah. Um, still doesn't really solve this problem. Ooh, it looks like I did this wrong. Um, so another problem in our test is if we, it's really easy to write a question that we think tests a particular thing and actually doesn't. Um, I brought this up a little bit when I was talking about uh, Quoref, or I guess when I was talking about Squad. So here in Squad, we had two basic reading primitives, which is I need to localize the question and then I need to extract an argument. It's really easy to write a question um, that has lexical hints that let me skip this step entirely because like if I say what year did something, 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 uh, if there's only one year in here, I don't need to know anything except the word year and I can answer the question. It turns out it's really easy to write questions like this. And so even if you're trying to do something fancy with Coref, you need to be careful that you don't get stuff that just has cheap tricks. Yeah? Well, we also seem to uh, expect some access to, to knowledge, to outside knowledge. Which right? you so for example, um, in your previous example, um, you had the text says, Ms. Pelosi, we ask a question about the Speaker of the House. That information is not contained within the text, but is external knowledge, right? So I can have a text that only mentions one year um, as a, as a you know, it, the matrix is made in 1999, mm -hmm. um, and then references something about who was president at the time, and after the end of that presidential term, they not even directly reference the year, right? Or I could have a difference, right? So the, the matrix two came out five years later. Exactly. Um, so um, the, in, in this paper, we enumerated a bunch of um, different strategies you could, you could use to try to mitigate this problem. And what you suggested is, is one of those that people have done, which is basically make sure, e either modify this or make sure that in the first place there are, there are distractors in some sense, like uh, not just one obvious candidate. Um, also, you, you referenced background knowledge. Um, it's funny, the, uh, I, I talked about the like special counsel as, as, as a background knowledge. I don't think there's actually a clear distinction between that kind of background knowledge and knowing that a year is a four-digit number that is in a particular range. And so like, it, you're, th this is a kind of background knowledge. I think you were getting at that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fuzzy, fuzzy point. But did that answer your question? OK. So yeah, in, in general, the point here is that um, when you're building this kind of test, if you want it to have like a, a convincing evaluation, you have to be really careful that 
the questions that you ask are actually testing what you think they are testing. And it's really easy to get that wrong unless you're really careful. Um, we, we've listed a bunch of these in a paper. I'm not going to go into the, the details of that right now. And I'm sure there are others that we didn't put in there too. Uh, what about generalization? So I, we hear all the time that some data set has data set artifacts and isn't actually testing what we think it is. That's related to this previous point, but I think it's a little bit broader than this too. Um, I, I think we want this test to have data that we don't have training data for. We want to be able to explicitly test generalization outside of the things that we trained it on. Otherwise, again, it's not really a convincing test. There was a, a workshop called Machine Reading and Question Answering um, at EMNLP this year that set up an evaluation that um, partitioned data sets into a trained data set, a dev data set, and a test data set, and you weren't allowed for this shared task to train on data sets that were in dev or test. There were particulars of that evaluation that I didn't really agree with, but the, the general idea is right, that we want to have data sets that we just don't have training data sets for. Um, and this, this will be much more convincing uh, in the end as a, as a test. OK, so that's what I think the test should look like. That's what should be on the test and how we grade the test. Um, I will conclude with our attempt to build a test like this. Um, as I said, this is, this is a, a daunting problem. And I don't think any one group is going to be able to solve this. And so I would, I would encourage all of you to help with this. Um, we, we have released, I guess it's live now, um, an open reading benchmark uh, that is a collection of any data set that we think is good. Um, that's a little bit subjective. Uh, that, um, and, and also not exhaustive just yet. I'm not claiming that we've, uh, if something is not in there, I'm not claiming that it's bad. Um, uh, any data set that matches the input format that I just talked about that we can evaluate, um, we want to test all of them at the same time. We put up a leaderboard, you submit one model, and it, it gets evaluated on all of these data sets at the same time. And our intent is for this, this benchmark to grow over time as more data sets are built. I mentioned a few uh, that we've already built. They're in there. I've mentioned a few that we haven't yet built but are under construction. They will be in here once they're built. This, this thing will grow. Um, here's an example of uh, what this looks like. There is an initial baseline on here. Um, the average metric isn't really all that meaningful, but we show it because we have to have something to rank with. But this number, the meaning of this number is going to change over time. Um, but yeah, you, if, you, if you want to test general reading comprehension, I'm not claiming that we're there yet. But I do think this is the best that we have for testing reading comprehension. Yes? The models as your teammates trained on? And what are the, uh, do you train them on each particular data set? Or do you... I don't care how you train your model. I'm going to evaluate your model on all of the test sets for all of the data sets that I have. That's it. So you, you could think of this as just an easier way of doing a multitask evaluation in a, in a standard way. That's it. <clears throat> is whatever the output space of all of these data sets is? It's about the same. So the, the union of all of the outputs. So there's squad two in here, there's drop. You have to be able to output numbers and dates and no answer option and all of them at the same time. The only constraint is that the inputs are the same. It's a paragraph and a question as input. And then you output whatever. If you have something like narrative QA, though, doesn't that limit you to generative outputs? Uh, depends on what you mean by limit. Um, other data sets also fit into that framework, even if they might be extracted or by I mean, I could generate something that's that's in my input. Generative outputs are a superset of the other outputs. Uh, yeah. I think it would be nice to have like a metric of how often models like decline to answer as a separate sort of F1, because I think that's one of the that's a good point for us. Yeah. Um, definitely, I think there are. Other interesting columns we could add to this. And um, yes, good point. And we're calling this an open reading benchmark, and I really mean open. Um, as I said, this making this kind of test is bigger than any one group can solve. Uh, 
I'm, I'm, I have a bunch of concurrent projects going on. We've built a bunch of data sets, but there is much more than I or anyone that I work with can do. And so our intent uh, is to add any, any, any data set that anyone builds, as long as it is good and it meets our input format, we will add it. And yes. What's your plan in terms of evolution of what's considered a correct answer? Both like the tip A, tip B example you gave earlier, also if you're really taking um, generative output and um, a test only includes the, the criminals or the two men as, um, or the drug dealers, sorry, the drug dealers as an answer. But if you've got a generative model that produces the criminals, that, that how do you update what's considered a right answer? It's a practical matter going forward. Good question. I, I talked about where we are working on building a metric that is learned that will hopefully, like, we're currently using F1 to evaluate on ropes, which is broken. Like, it correlates very poorly with human judgments. Um, we want to replace that with a better metric. And this benchmark, as I said, these numbers are, are going to change. Like, I'm, I'm just fine having even relative ordering of things and absolute numbers here changing over time as we are more confident in having good metrics that actually work, that correlate with what humans say. So my answer to, I guess, that question is, I know there's a problem with our metrics. I want to improve them over time, and we will change this as we get better metrics. Is that, is that fair? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, but we're working on it. Fair, fair enough, yes. Define metrics for like extractive means than for generative models. Yes. So why not limit to that? Because you you asking why questions is a huge part of what it means. Like being able to answer why questions is a huge part of what it means to read. Uh, I didn't mention Cosmos QA on here, but it's an, a really interesting data set released by colleagues on the Mosaic team at AI2 that asks uh, a bunch of like why kinds of questions about common sense kinds of stuff that happens in paragraphs. It's a multiple choice data set. I would love to make, a, I guess they did evaluate um, uh, free, freeform generative kind of stuff. I'd love to include that in here as soon as I'm confident in a metric that actually works. Um, OK, um, to conclude, um, current benchmarks, as we've seen, are insufficient to, co to convince a reasonable researcher that machines can actually read. There's a whole lot that we need to do to get to that point, and it's a bigger problem than anyone can do on their own. And so I would encourage everyone uh, to work together on this to make it, like, actually make a test that, that would be convincing to us. And that's it. Julian. Uh, so you introduced question answering as like a uh, kind of viable universal for reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. But when you were going through all of the individual data sets, it sounds like you know when your data set is specifically formulated to test a certain reasoning capacity, uh, the question answering format may not be necessary. At least that's the <laughs> sense that I got. So for example, when you're detecting events, it's more about detecting and then ordering things. Um, and then if you're forcing it into the question answering paradigm, you might run into evaluation problems where you wouldn't otherwise if you kind of just surface the natural structure of the data set directly. So I guess my question is, how do you navigate the, like this problem, which I, I think has showed up in a lot of other research where they try to recast things as question answering, mm -hmm. but like it, it introduces more difficulties for the model that aren't inherent to the comprehension task? That's a really good question. Um, my take on this is that, uh, well, two, two points. First one is there are a broad class of things for which we don't have good formalisms or uh, things where our formalisms are fuzzy and break down. I know you would agree with this. We talked about this earlier. SRL has problems when you push on it. Uh, and maybe you disagree with how the formalism was constructed. And maybe natural language is a better way of representing this formalism in the first place, as your QA SRL and QA MR work show, right? So. <laughs> I, I say that because indeed that that is part of the inspiration for like how I'm talking about this. Um, uh, yes, uh, like th there are cases where natural language is is just a better way of talking about these problems because we can't define them in formal terms with like some annotation format that we can actually uh, produce. Um, the the second answer um, is that I think for e even like. Um, 
conjunction, dis like di distribution of conjunctions. Um, that's, uh, the, so like, uh, I'm thinking of Phoebe, we, we worked on a project that, that did this, two men and babies versus two, uh, sorry, old men and babies versus old men and women. They're the, the and, the old distributes over the and differently. Um, and um, it's one thing to be able to like predict which one uh, is, uh, um, like, w sorry, uh, whether it's distributed in a particular way. It's another thing to operationalize that, that prediction to do something else with it. And so the question, formulating it as question answering is most effective and interesting when you can um, not just like recast the particular annotation as a question, but actually ask a question that requires doing something with the output of that prediction. Does that make sense? And so uh, I guess in some sense I, I agree with you that it's not that interesting if the only thing that I'm doing is saying like what are the part of speech tags and now I'm like outputting something. Uh, it's a lot, and, and yet there, there are still a lot of interesting things that I can do. Um, we should think carefully about when it makes the most sense to cast things this way, and that's not always. It seems like each of these data sets has a very specific type of uh, source material that you can use to ask questions about. Um, and you sort of started by saying that to prove that we understand, or to prove that a machine understands something, we should be able to ask arbitrary questions about a specific piece of text. But sort of, it seems like what you've done is you've asked specific types of questions about specific types of text. Um, is there a sense in which we can show that machines understand maybe a simple form of language, like you know, children's book kind of things, um, where we can ask really arbitrary questions, like you can't come up with any other questions than blah, blah, blah um, about this text and then show sort of building up from there in terms of uh, sort of cognitive levels of understanding rather than these sort of different specific types of uh, question domains. I completely agree. This is something we've thought about. Um, we found it easiest to make progress in picking some phenomenon and figuring out where it's easiest to test that phenomenon um, and building a data set around that. But I agree it would be really, really interesting and good to try to, after you have all of these phenomena, um, find a set of paragraphs where you could create all of them or as many as, as, as exhaustively as you can on a single input. I, I definitely agree. Just to sort of follow up with that, assuming some data set like that exists, and assuming you tested some system on it, so there's some simple language, and you can ask a machine arbitrary questions about it, and it can answer right 95% of the time. Would you actually say that it understands that text, or would you say that it's more work needs to be done for some other test in some other way? I mean, if I was confident in the questions I was asking, and it's able to get all of them right, I don't know why I wouldn't conclude that it understands what the text is. I don't know any other basis to, to talk about what it means to understand. Phoebe? Yeah, so uh, to what extent do you think that the things that incorporate external knowledge, like you talked about grounding, um, how much do you think that's necessary for the definition of, of reading, of, of understanding a piece of text? It seems like um, with like the examples you gave, um, external knowledge is used to sort of uh, connect the question to text, basically. Um, but you could also, I don't know, I, I feel like once you're, you're taking background knowledge into account, that sort of opens up a can of worms where uh, maybe the text is using some phrase to mean one thing, but um, uh, maybe new information that wasn't available when the text was written has changed that meaning. So if the text talks about uh, the president, for example, mm -hmm. uh, who is the president? Yeah, to um, totally fair. Yep. Or, or even just like maybe the text uh, is, is looking for a specific answer um, and, and information has, has changed, like the scientific state of the art has changed and so the answer is different. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. Yeah, yeah, there were a bunch of questions in here. Um, uh, the, what, you're, what you bring up is precisely why I said I don't really buy that particular for framing of that problem as I presented it, right? I, I hedged a whole lot when I talked about that on purpose because you're right. 
Um, I would also say, as, as we've talked about earlier, that um, it's really fuzzy to like say what, can you really say what is the difference between knowing that Mr. Mueller was special counsel at this particular time and that, that a year is of this four digit number or that these two phrases are paraphrases of each other. This is a slang way of saying this thing. Like, is that world knowledge? Like, our, our lexicon is like full of world knowledge. So how do you like really talk about the differences here? It's hard. Um, and then uh, to answer one other point that you made, um, I, my, my comprehension of a text in like cognitive psychology is going to be incredibly dependent on my prior knowledge about that, that topic. And so in some sense, yes, for humans, um, the background knowledge that we have influences our reading comprehension. We have to know the terms that are being used in order to understand what's being said. And again, this is something that's really hard to like distinguish, like to, there's like a, a gray scale that you, you can't really put firm boundaries on for like what is background knowledge that you need versus what's in your lexicon versus whatever. Like it's, it's these, these are hard issues to, to grapple with. I think it's not even necessarily If I give you a text that's ten, that's usually ten postulates, and then start throwing theorems at you, <laughs> there's no background knowledge that's missing. Yeah. But it, what fail, what we what we want to call that a failure of reading comprehension. It's a failure of reading comprehension. Yeah, and like we we have this drop data set that requires doing arg maxes and addition and subtraction and stuff, and. That's why I tried to distinguish between reading primitives and reasoning primitives. And to succeed on the data set, you need both, yes. Um, and it, it's very hard to think about like really comprehensively testing reading without needing some additional like uh, machinery in order to, to do the query correctly, which is like I think that, that the numerical reasoning is kind of an unfortunate uh, necessity that we needed to, in order to get the comprehensive test of the sentence structure in drop. Um, this raises a question that Gerbil's is completely clear on, but I'll repose this one. Um, just uh, another question from the cutting edge of, of, of reading. Uh, I've encountered one method which is different um, for assessing reading comprehension, uh, different than question answer, which involves filling in the blanks, where mm -hmm. the blanks will be of arbitrary length in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like uh, that sidesteps the localization piece, which is why we know where the blanks sit. Um, and it also seems to, to challenge the problem of, of, of evaluation against the wrong truth, because the longer the blank, the more fluidity or generativity can show up in filling the blanks. Have you encountered this? Is that much of that case as an alternative? I know, like there's a Lambda data set. That, that, so there are some that are similar. Um, the 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 first like what was it teaching machines to read and comprehend one of the first big papers in the deep learning era that did this was um, from I believe it was DeepMind the CNN Daily Mail data set um, that uh, asks questions as close style fill in the blank stuff um, I haven't really thought about whether that would be better or worse I think you, you will get different kinds of stuff maybe. It, maybe it would help um, getting some coverage. There are definitely things I can think of that you couldn't test very well in that way. Like, why did something happen? I don't know, does that answer your question? Mostly. Sorry, I can't do better. So Julie? I think Swag is probably a pretty good example of, of an instance of this. Mm -hmm. And this is a data set where basically video captions, I don't know if Rowan is doing that, but video captions were, were taken and then like the next event, like a verb phrase in the sentence was, was dropped and you have to complete it. But to make it evaluatable, they make it multiple choice, but do some adversarial filtering to make sure that like the multiple choice is very difficult and try to remove the artifacts that you were talking about. I think one of the things is, especially if you have open-ended generation kind of stuff, it's like really, really hard to evaluate mm -hmm. plot because there might be many plausible interpretations, right? Yeah, and also there's like a book Book Corpus, I've, it's been a while, I forget the name of it, but there was one that's basically fill in the blank on a bunch of children's books. Children's book test, book, some, I think that's what it's called, by Facebook folks. Um, and 
not a lot on like arbitrary length blanks and swag and length are both the blank is always at the end, which is a particular constraint that you may not be optimal. It's an interesting idea. Uh, I haven't really thought about it too much. I I will know when I'm done when I'm when I'm convinced, like. When I can ask, what, when I have exhausted all the questions I can think of, and like I, I see a system, I can interact with it, and it does everything, I'll be convinced. Will we see that? I don't know. We'll try to get there. <laughs> at, at least we, we, we do have a good way of saying that we um, have more coverage than we did before. I don't know how to quantify that in absolute terms, but at least we have comparative terms. I don't think there really is a hard line, which makes that very challenging. 